welcome to today's panel on new perspectives on crime, violence, and victims of Latin America. Uh, I want to recognize this event is made possible by the staff and the leadership of the Institute of Latin American Studies at Columbia University in coordination with Columbia's Law, Latin American Student Association. Uh, I'm Eduardo Moncada, uh, I'm an associate professor of global science here at Barnard College of Columbia, and it's my absolute pleasure to be able to moderate today's conversation. Um, before I introduce our exciting uh, slate of speakers, I just want to say a few quick words about the focus of our conversation today. Um, crime and violence are among the core challenges that Latin America is facing today. Uh, we are fortunate now to have a panel of very distinguished scholars who are going to help us to, to understand the landscapes of crime and violence, and particularly through the lens of victims. Uh, and by bringing the experience of victims into their analyses, uh, victims of violence at the hands of organized crime, victims of violence at the hands of state actors, uh, these scholars are working at the cutting edge of growing academic research and policy work on the origins and dynamics and consequences of crime and violence in Latin America. I'm going to briefly introduce each speaker in the order in which they will present. Um, so uh, first up, we have Martina Lasalle, who is a sociologist who holds a PhD in social sciences from the University of Buenos Aires. Uh, we're fortunate that she's also here with us as an Argentine Studies Visiting Fellow at the Institute of Latin American Studies. She's currently an assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the uh, Universidad de Buenos Aires and a postdoctoral fellow at the National Scientific and Technical Research Council in Argentina. And Martina conducts research on violence, crime, and punishment in Argentina with a special focus on the functioning of the criminal justice system. Uh, next up is Paul Fazzi, an Argentine Studies Visiting Fellow also at the Institute of Latin American Studies. Paul holds a PhD in sociology from the University of California, Berkeley. He is an independent researcher at the National University of Cordoba, working with the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina. And his research delves into the social determinants of organized state coercion and violence in Latin America. And his research has been funded by the Tinker and Ford Foundations, among others. And that's taken him to Austria, Brazil, and Mexico as a visiting researcher and professor. Uh, next up is Veronica Subillaga who's the Edward Lerro Tinker Visiting Professor here at the ILAS. She is a Venezuelan sociologist, professor at the Universidad Sin Bolivar. Her research over the past 20 years has focused on urban violence, youth gang violence in Caracas, gender and public policy. Uh, Zubillaga is a strong advocate for arms control and disarmament with publications, in recent publications, including The Paradox of Violence in Venezuela, uh, published with David Smiled and Rebecca Hansen, out from University of Pittsburgh Press. And she's received grants from numerous prestigious institutions, including the Fulbright Foundation and the Open Society Foundation. And we have our fourth speaker, Sarah Daly, an associate professor of political science at Columbia University. Her two wonderful books, Organized Violence After Civil War and Violent Victors, have garnered critical acclaim and awards. Violent Victors received the 2023 Leon Epstein Outstanding Book Award from the American Political Science Association mm -hmm. and was also shortlisted for the 2023 Gregory Rubert Prize for the best book in comparative politics from the American Political Science Association. Sarah has received numerous awards for her research, including the Andrew Andrew Carnegie Fellowship and the Minerva United States Institute of Peace Award. And her research has appeared in top journals in political science. She holds a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. So with that, I'm going to step aside <laughs> and turn it over to Martina to get us started. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo, for organizing the panel and for inviting me. Uh, I'm Martina, and in my intervention, I would like um, to make some reflections on um, lethal violence and penal responses in Argentina. Over the last years, I've been doing research on this question in Buenos Aires, um, and I would like to present some ideas on uh, the punishment of certain types of homicides um, that are not very much, uh, that, that they don't have much social visibility, although they represent a significant proportion of lethal violence in Buenos Aires and also in other provinces uh, of Argentina. Uh, so in mass media and in many contemporary social and political discourses, uh, violent death is often very much linked to robberies, especially to robberies committed by young men from low social classes. Um, that is maybe the reason why when we think about intentional homicide, we tend to think about a homicide committed in the middle of a robbery. However, these are not the most frequent homicides, um, not even in the metropolitan area of Buenos Aires, where these type of homicides are quite more frequent uh, than in other regions of the country. So this is, can we put the first? 
the first slide. That, thank you. So this is data from the Buenos Aires Prosecution Office. <clears throat> You have information about criminal proceedings initiated in 2022. Uh, as you can see, among the homicides committed in Buenos Aires in this year, uh, those homicides resulting from interpersonal conflicts uh, represent 30% of the homicides, and uh, they have the higher statistical frequency, while homicides committed in the middle of robberies represent 16% of these homicides. Now, if we uh, exclude those homicides where uh, there, there was not motivation identified by the prosecution office, we see that the, the percentage of homicides product of interpersonal conflicts increases to 37%. These homicides are basically uh, the result of rivalry between people, of, of fights or discussions where the level of conflict escalates and where there's no premeditation. So given that this type of homicides uh, represent uh, a significant proportion of lethal violence in Buenos Aires, it is certainly important to answer some questions. For instance, who commit these homicides and who are the main victims of them? And also, how does the criminal justice system respond or punish them? The next one. <clears throat> so generally speaking, we see that uh, those um, who are convicted of uh, these kinds of homicides have the very same uh, sociological profile as those people uh, convicted of other offenses or of other intentional homicides. Mm -hmm. Basically, they are young men with uh, very low levels of formal education and from lower social classes. And victims have the very same characteristics. So these types of homicides are homicides resulting from interpersonal conflicts between young men um, from urban low-income neighborhoods. Now, if you look, if we look at the sentences, the next one, imposed to this, uh, I mean, to um, intentional homicides in Argent in Buenos Aires, sorry, in general, we see that the penalties uh, are distributed in this way. 19% of this uh, of the inmates. Um, convicted of intentional homicide received uh, life imprisonment sentences. This percentage includes um, homicides, for example, like uh, homicides in the middle of robberies or femicides during the last years, also homicides committed by mothers against their children. But the rest, 81%, did not receive life uh, sentences and uh, interpersonal uh, homicides are included in this 81%. We also see that for these homicides, punishments are much closer to the minimum in the penal scale, which is eight years of imprisonment, than to the maximum, which is 25 years. And uh, the average in the duration of the punishments of the people who are in prison, uh, who were in prison in 2022 was 11.8 years of imprisonment, and this number has not changed much during the last 15 years. And we also see that 42%, now we can change to the other one, thanks. We also see that 42% of these homicides were punished with less than 11 years and 35% with less than nine years of imprisonment. So this means that a significant proportion of homicides were punished um, very similarly than robberies where there, there were uh, no victims, deadly victims, or people <laughs> injured. In Buenos Aires, 22% uh, of the um, robberies were punished with between seven and nine years of imprisonment, or, and 10 years, sorry, of imprisonment, and 10% uh, of the robberies with more than 11 years of imprisonment. So how can we explain this? How can we explain this kind of unexpected disproportion between punishments set for this type of homicides and for robberies where there were no people injured nor deaths. So I want to introduce like two arguments. Uh, I think that penal practices show at least two important things. On the one hand, the strong classism of the criminal justice system, which is not only seen in the over-representation of um, people from low social classes in, in prisons, 
but also in the ways in which charges modulate punishments. Robberies, uh, which are the uh, offenses against property uh, committed mostly by uh, people or individuals from low social classes and where the victims are from all social, the, the, I mean, the whole social spectrum, receive very harsh punishments in comparison to homicides where what is at stake is life and not property, and where both perpetrators and victims are men from low social classes. And one frequent argument given by prosecutors and criminal judges as well has to do with the violent nature of robberies. But the thing is that this claim loses certain strength when we make this kind of comparison, because could there be anything more violent than a homicide? Well, for this criminal justice system, some robberies uh, may seem more violent than many homicides where the life of young men from low social classes are at stake. This is like uh, one, one first important thing. The second thing I would like to, to mention uh, is linked to the patriarchal and gender orientation of these penal practices. Uh, if these homicides receive mild punishments uh, in comparison to certain robberies and to other type of homicides as well, it is because they are considered more expected, more, con more conceivable, and therefore they are more tolerated because they occur among men. The naturalization of the fact that men, um, especially young men, are more likely to kill than women uh, is linked directly linked to the hegemonic way of understanding masculinity that shapes penal practices. So as you know, this way of understanding masculinity associates masculinity to uh, omnipotence, to certain aggressivity. And this leads in a certain, in a certain way to naturalize violent uh, behavior, especially in men, and especially in men from low social classes. Mm -hmm. So we might view both class system and this uh, hegemonic way of understanding masculinity are very helpful to understand how the criminal justice system in Buenos Aires is considering these homicides and treating them in consequence. Um, as I mentioned before, these homicides represent a significant part of lethal violence in the province. Uh, and I consider that if uh, for any public policy that seeks to reduce, for example, this type of violence, um, it, it should be necessarily considered how the criminal justice system is working, how the criminal justice system is punishing these violent deaths in comparison to other offenses, and in general terms, how uh, how worthy life is for this system. And it's, it should also consider social meanings that um, are put in motion in this violent death, because as many studies, sociological and criminological studies have shown, uh, the approach uh, to violence should cannot be only economist, but it also has to be culturalist. And I'm finishing with this. Um, I think that the importance of analyzing juridical processes of criminalization um, when thinking on violence and homicide is actually a, a, not a new perspective or original perspective, but it is something sometimes forgotten um, especially when we assume that crime and criminality are something given and that the criminal system only reacts to an already constituted phenomenon. In this sense, this uh, uni unilateral approach prevents us from um, considering that the criminalization uh, practices of criminalization can amplify or deepen the problems they are coming to solve. That is perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Martina. That was fascinating. Um, and certainly gives us a lot to think about and, and talk about. Um, before I turn it over to Paul, I'll just remind um, both folks who are here uh, and folks who are joining us via Zoom to uh, make sure to write down your questions and we'll have a question and answer session after everyone's presentation. And I believe the folks online are able to send their questions to us directly via the Zoom. Uh, so next up is Paul Plaza. <clears throat> well, uh... Thank you, Eduardo. I want to thank Eduardo for putting up this panel. And um, 
the Fundar Foundation for allowing me to be here with you. What I'm going to talk about, well, uh, for a long time I've been studying the, the transformation of the penal state, the police, the courts, uh, the criminal courts, and the prisons in, uh, in Latin America, in Chile, Argentina, and a little bit in Mexico. And now I'm studying uh, that at the subnational level in Argentina. Um, in relation to the panel, which was the perspectives of crime, violence, and victims, uh, I try to make uh, an argument and a connection between those institutional developments in the criminal justice uh, system and in, basically in police and criminal courts capacities um, and criminality in some provinces uh, of Argentina. The, the basic research project, which is uh, been taking place for over uh, two years, is about trying to explain the different structures of the criminal justice police and courts in, in, in some national level in, in Argentina, uh, following the is, yes, following the Thanks. okay, uh, very different than one from here. Yes. <laughs> uh, following the the expansion of the police capacity and of the criminal courts, but I'm especially uh, interested in the ways in which the control of, um, of political actors and the judiciary over the police impacts, um, impacts the capacity of the state to control crime. And if you can pass it. Um, okay. Uh, well, it's very different from the um, so why um, so why should we matter about police and criminal course capacity? Well, following the work of, of Marcelo Bergman mm -hmm. and his theory of different levels of crime equilibria, he argues that there are two two main aspects to that determine the 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 fact that a, that a low crime equilibrium will remain a low crime equilibrium and not uh, evolve towards a high crime equilibrium. And one is the expansion of illegal markets, but the other one is the capacity of the state to react to those expansions in crime. And if we see it, um, and I argue that the capacity to react, and also as, as Marcelo Berna argues, is not only a matter of expansion of police and force capacity, but also of, of um, uh, creating police forces that are controlled by political actors and by judicial actors in order to have uh, constant and legal control of criminality and um, reduce corruption and also control legal markets in a way, uh, the illegal markets and specifically drug markets and drug uh, drug trafficking organizations which are behind many of uh, many of the homicides that take place in the different provinces. So what I'm going to describe today and it's uh, a specific paradox which is well first we can find very different variations in homicides in the different provinces. We have uh, a, an evolution that went from basically seven per hundred thousand to a duplication in uh, the province of Santa Fe and a more or less general reduction in Cordoba uh, and Mendoza. I want to highlight that Cordoba, Mendoza, and for those who don't know, Cordoba, Mendoza, and Santa Fe are like the most, um, is that, um, Buenos Aires, the most um, uh, provinces with the biggest urban. Uh, populations and industrial and agricultural developed economies. So we have very different rates in homicides, which you can see also, but which are, don't go together with um, changes in uh, robberies. You can see that in Santa Fe and Cordoba, Santa Fe is the most violent in terms of homicide, but uh, it's similar to Cordoba in terms of in terms of robberies and. Mendoza always has a, had a, a higher uh, robbery rate, uh, was a spike in this 2015. But these very different uh, criminalities, in turn, so the one where we have the most homicides, so please pass two Next. more. Uh, 
is Santa Fe, which is the, the orange one here, has duplicated its police forces in the last 20 years. And Cordoba has tripled the number of police forces, which is we see it in terms of, this does one more, we see it in terms of rates, it produced almost, it goes almost from 500 per 100,000 policemen to almost 700, and in Cordoba it went from 250 to 500. And even if we have those enormous increases in policing capacities, in terms of general uh, state policing capacity, we still have very deep, big differences in terms of criminality. So how do we to explain that expansion with no, with no efficacy or with lesser or very different efficacy, particularly uh, in relation to controlling uh, uh, the levels of homicides in the province, in, of, particularly of Santa Fe, which is the one that has the greatest rate of policemen per 100,000. And what I would argue, and following this pass for the next one, uh, what I would argue, well, uh, of course, I draw on a, on a, on a growing literature on um, security policies and police reform. But I'm interested in trying to analyze why different provinces, these different provinces, develop very different types of control over the police. A control that can be a political, uh, informal control, or a control that can be a formalized, institutionalized control, either administrative control or judicial control through the expansion of the judiciary. So in here, here I'm following uh, Janilda, or dialoguing with Janilda Gonzalez's work, who's very interested, who has pointed out, among others, about the centrality of political dynamics, stronger positions to the governing party that lead the police to, uh, lead authorities to reform the police. The police usually reacts contrary to those plans and police, uh, politicians tend to develop arrangements with the police not engaging in institutionalized, formalized control. So what produces the overcoming just for five minutes, okay. Uh, in the case of uh, the problem, an aspect, however, that's not in, in, in the work of, of, of Gonzalez is the parallel developments that take place within the criminal court system and also have to be, I would argue, have to be taken in place. And well, the, the work by Eduardo Mocha, uh, whom you may know, it, um, also highlights political coalitions, but highlights very centrally the connections, political and economic actors coalitions, but also the connection which is national and local dynamics or the disconnection, how does that work? Uh, but and to that, I would argue a number of other mechanisms and particularly to Argentina, for Argentina, one of the main mechanisms is the the tension between the executive branch and uh, political bureaucracy and police bureaucracies in conditions of uh, systematic economic crisis, which makes the, or the executive branch have constantly problems to control uh, the police because the capacity, the possibilities of giving them money is uh, obviously, uh, always in, in, in danger. So, that central mechanism that is that what I would argue is the, the need of the executive to control the police formally or informally. But the, if we want to understand why do the executive, and this is what I try to explain, why does the executive try to uh, invest in formalized police control and means to administrative boards or investing in, in, in criminal justice reform by producing powerful prosecutors that in turn will control the police to investigate, et cetera, we have to take into account the constant need of the executive to control the police, also the presidential aspirations of the governors who may prevent scandals by controlling uh, the police and um, things that jeopardize this uh, control and tend to lead the structure towards informal control is the uh, renewal of parties when there is a change in party that tends to be many problems to control the police. And what I propose to do is to analyze, this is what I do in my work, to do a process tracing, but at different moments trying to explain the intervention of a multiplicity of mechanisms, the most important of which is the need of the executive branch to control the police and the constant uh, problems it faces 
in different administrations. So, so you can pass to the next, uh, to the next one. Basically, I, I don't have time in five minutes to describe, but what I do in, in my work is to describe very, uh, very in a detailed manner how the different mechanisms which are here uh, presented in red lead to either informal acted upon controls or more institutionalized controls which are which come up from a variety of, of causes but the most important ones are the turnover in the learning party in Cordoba and the installed you know, installed capacities judicial and criminal justice capacities so it's also a story of past dependency if before the crime waves there was already an installed capacity criminal justice capacity to eventually project it to uh, expand it to control the police uh, that was going to be through accumulative uh, processes at the end of the of the story after two or three after two decades results in what I describe as the combination of party continuity with executive governors, executive branch governors aspiring to be presidents and therefore investing in political control over the police, not to have, not to, to prevent police scandals and not having the possibility to count on the national government to face security crisis. That led in Cordoba to the expansion of the police, but also to the institutionalization of formal control and judicial control. That was not the case, uh, and judicial control over the police. That in turn means stronger control of the executive branch over the police and stronger control of the police over drug markets. That prevents the creation of powerful uh, drug organizations and a reduction of crime. In Santa Fe, things were different. There was no initial, um, no initial criminal justice reform or powerful, and there was a high turnover in political parties, constantly making the executive branch face problems of control, but there was no investment in formalized political control there. Informal political control remained, and uh, the outcome is a highly autonomous police force, which in turn is highly fragmented, which manages and is allied with different drug groups, which allows for the empowerment of drug organizations and higher uh, violence, uh, produce, violence related to drug markets. Here you can see the effects, and please pass to the next one. Uh, the effects in the capacities to um, indict and arrest in terms of drug capacities, you could see they're very similar after 2015. And since then, given the reforms that took place in those years, the capacities to uh, pursue and punish uh, drug violations increases dramatically in Cordoba and it doesn't in Santa Fe and uh, in Santa Fe and also in Mendoza, which is the other place. So we saw we still have, and please pass to the last one, so we still have a passage from a low crime equilibrium in uh, Santa Fe uh, towards a high crime equilibrium sustained after 2017 and uh, avoidance of that passage or that transition in Cordoba and in Mendoza. And I argue it's related to the modernity of the control of the executive over the police and the capacity of the judiciary also to control the police. And that's it. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. That's great. Um, mm -hmm. Why don't we turn it over to Veronica? Thank you. So thank you, Eduardo, for organizing this panel. And of course, thank you to the Tinker Foundation for having this wonderful opportunity to be here. So what I will share with you is some thoughts about my recent researches. So um, I will start saying that one of the recent numbers of the forum, you can go, yes, of the, of the forum, the, this is the Latin American Studies Association quarterly newsletter, was devoted to understanding and discussing criminal governances in Latin America. So cutting edge scholars such as Eduardo Moncada was there, Angelica Duran Martinez, Ben Lessing, Marcelo Bergman were discussing 
and um, helping to understand the impact of criminal governances in Latin America, understanding criminal governances as the fact that vast territories in our continent and numbers, millions of inhabitants in Latin America live under the rule of criminal organizations. So um, myself, I contributed to, to, that, um, to that dossier, but one of my worries was precisely where are women represented in these studies? So, so women are the ones who spend uh, much time in their communities, raising kids, organizing community daily lives, but women are not represented, are not focused in these studies. So I devoted, so doing ethnography in Caracas, I devoted my recent research to understand how criminal governances impact women's daily life. How do they deal with living daily lives with guns in their lives and armed actors in their everyday life? So I will go very quickly to my, you can, one of the, of my recent researchers that is in dialogue with Eduardo's political, uh, the um, politics of victimization. It tries to understand uh, women's strategies to deal with they in their daily lives with armed actors. So I grasp all the thresholds of the different strategies women try to, um, to put in action to deal with the daily presence of armed actors in, in their lives. So one of the one of the strategies was of course submission and taking refuge uh, refuge uh, sending their kids to other countries or other communities in other cases there were women collaborating with armed actors for instance in the armed confrontations they they were helping uh, the armed um, actors uh, for instance also women who were the mothers of the criminal uh, of, of the criminals, they were helping them. And then they have, they take the privilege of being the mothers of this, of this man. In other cases, we had uh, women resistant and using subtle strategies such as gossip. Uh, but in other cases, we had the fact of negotiating and using the role of motherhood in a very strategical way to deal and to negotiate spaces free of guns uh, with the armed actors. So after this, then, hey, can you go through it? And working also with Desmond Arias, trying to think about the variability of criminal governances in Caracas, then again, I told myself what, how are women experimenting this variability of, uh, of violence? How are they dealing? So I chose two communities that had very different um, histories of civic organization, but also different experiences of policing. And then the idea was to compare, again, women's strategies towards armed, uh, towards armed uh, men. So and one community has been devastated, Lakota has been devastated by Mano Dura policies. You can see this is the entrance of the community. And the other community, Catuche, has a long history of civic organization. So what I, what we, Rebecca Hanson and me realized is that in the community where there was this tradition of civic organization. Women had different tools to negotiate spaces free of gun and violence for their kids. They even reached a ceasefire pact with the criminal actors. And, uh, and, they, and it was very interesting to grasp how they used motherhood as a strategical tool, tool. For instance, one of the women said, well, I scold them as if they were my 
my kids if they if they if they dare to not respect the ceasefire pact they agreed so and then also it was very interesting to to see how gossip was a strategic tool to control um, the armed uh, men's um, actions. For instance, gossip, as we know from anthrop anthropology, is one of the strategies of, of, is one of the weapons of the week, as mm -hmm. Scott invites us to think. So, so women could threaten the young men saying that if you don't behave, we will, and then we will speak uh, very bad about you or I mean they were playing with this young man's reputation because gossip of course the efficacy of gossip is the fact that it has real consequences in real life for instance one if one of the young men are systematically pointed out of not respecting the community's agreement he could be uh, he could be killed by one of the older uh, armed men in the barrios, or he could be denounced to the police. So gossip was a, a very important um, tool in order to control young men's action. But in the other community, what we um, grasped, um, the other community where mano dura policies were implemented, these military massive invasions in the community activated a warfare mode in 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 um, among the criminal among the criminal group so the criminal group started um had uh almost a despotic regime in the community for instance one woman was born in the middle of the day just to show the uh, i mean just as an exemplary punishment to show women what could happen if they dare to speak. So we can see that discursive strategies uh, are an important stake in daily lives communities. So in this community, women, in, uh, in contrast to the other community, women were, were in a permanent state of fear. So they were whispering all the time. They didn't dare to speak. They didn't dare to shout. For instance, when, we, when I was doing the, the their research, they only um, spoke about the men if we were the two of us together with nobody present. And again, they whispered. They didn't, uh, they didn't even dare to speak about the men with their higher voices. So, um, so women, and then the other, the other important aspect is that gossip in in that context gossip loses all the efficacy it promises because of course one of the powerful characteristics characteristics of gossip mm -hmm. is the fact that it circulates so and this is why it it has consequences but in this case women were so afraid that gossip kept captive so in, in my work, I'm trying to make this different difference between circulating gossip and captive, captive um, gossip. So what I'm trying to show, and specifically nowadays where mano dura policies are becoming so popular in the continent, um, is the fact that these military and massive interventions in communities deprive women of all the everyday tools to resist criminal groups' violence. And I will leave it here. Thanks. Thanks, Veronica. Lots to think about as well. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Just another reminder please have your questions ready for the end and as well as online. Please go ahead and you can start sending your questions. I'll be gathering them and posing them to our, our speakers today. Sarah, please. Uh, well, thank you so much to Isla. Thank you so much to Eduardo, to the Isla staff. Um, and it's such a privilege to share this panel with you all. And welcome to Colombia. We're so happy that you are here this semester um, and able to be in dialogue, not only at this panel, but, but in general. Um, so this, I've been working on a project on trying to explain the intractability of criminal violence in Latin America. 
if you could advance. Um, and particularly, why is this this region that has the highest homicide rate in the world, um, that it accounts for 14% of the world's population, and yet it has more than 40% of the world's homicides. And we know that there are these e homicidal ecologies, as Deborah Yashar calls them, that the region is close to the United States with its very large um, drug uh, consumer market, that uh, their the supply side US narco counter narcotics policy has been ineffective, largely ineffective, um, that we had the recent end of the commodity boom, the high levels of socioeconomic inequality, rapid urbanization, all sorts of sort of uh, structural features, uh, weak states, a long history of criminality. So we have this sort of fertile environment for violence. Um, but at the same time, while there has been this kind of constant, there's also so much variation in the region. And these structural features, mm -hmm. um, including poverty and inequality and unemployment and um, education and uh, mass incarceration, et cetera, et cetera, they can't explain when and why and how violence will erupt. And we know that specific regions particularly are, are especially prone to violence, valuable trafficking routes, for example. Um, but even in these valuable trafficking routes, at times organized crime can manage to form agreements and truces that limit violence. And limiting violence is by far better for business than having turf war. And at the same time, the state will crack down on some organized crime, um, uh, organizations of criminal activity in illicitly valuable territories, but will collude with others in identical territories. And we also know that territories with multiple armed actors tend to be more prone to violence, um, but this is not an unavoidable outcome. Um, instead, there, these armed organizations have the capacity to negotiate and to bargain to limit violence, even where you have multiple actors. Um, and at the same time, we do know that more hegemonic areas are less prone to violence, areas with, again, with multiple armed actors in, con in um, competition are more prone to violence, but it's not inevitable because every organization will abut another organization somewhere. And so the question is, what happens in those border turfs? And the overall question, if you could advance, is, why do conflicts between criminal groups and between these groups in the state arise? And why do they become so intractable? And the project overall argues that there are a variety of different um, policies and reforms, both domestic and international and transnational, mm -hmm. that change the balance of power between criminal groups. And in so doing, spark vicious cycles of violence because these turf wars engender a reaction by the state that further shifts the balance of power between the criminal groups. So if you could advance, what does this argument look like? There are all of these different types of inputs into criminal organizations, and I'll discuss these in just a minute. And there are so many different types of policies that can shock these inputs into the criminal, the power of the criminal organizations and do so in ways that are differential, relatively strengthening certain armed groups, armed criminal groups, while weakening other armed criminal groups. And if in so doing, these groups are not able to effectively negotiate and bargain to limit violence, you see criminal turf war emerging. And when criminal turf war emerges, you have a huge spike in visible violence, which affects the population. And I'll discuss how it does so. And through a bargaining, I mean, through an electoral pathway of demand and supply of manadores, it's very much built off of the, the previous um, presentation, creates a state war against the criminal groups, which further shifts the balance of power. So you might not be able to see, but the arrow goes back to the shock to the balance of power. And so that's this vicious cycle that emerges. 
So what do I mean by inputs into the criminal organization? And what are examples of these types of policies that will shock the balance of power? Um, so criminal power is based on arms and based on turf and based on recruits and finances and networks and leadership and command and control and corruptive capacity and ties to the population. And these are some of the inputs into a criminal organization and from which it derives its power. So for example, this goes beyond the region. Um, in related work in Chicago, um, this, is a, this is in the United States, but we see similar effects on arms in the Latin American region as well. So for example, regulatory changes um, with, with the expiration of the US assault weapon ban resulted in a rise in deathly criminal activity, activities in Mexico in the regions adjacent to the US border. So in a similar um, study that I uh, conducted with a PhD candidate here at Columbia, um, Elena Barham, we look at a repeal to um, a gun um, control law in Wisconsin that shocked the supply of guns crossing over into the border into Illinois. And so you see this big, big spike in guns that go across the border from Wisconsin to Illinois. But gangs have differential gun acquisition networks, and some have networks in Wisconsin and are able to benefit from this um, from this relatively tragic gun law repeal. And so you see in this um, map to the right, the gangs at a block level that were shocked, meaning they were relatively strengthened and able to gain more guns relative to um, gangs that did not have these gun acquisition networks. And we see that these shocks to this balance of power meant that in certain cases, um, if you can advance, um, I'll, I'll describe the, the findings in just a second. I just wanna tell you about another type of shock, um, which is a shock to turf, which we know is really important for criminal group power. And this is a shock that came again in the Chicago context around um, the demolition of the housing projects, which were the hearts of these gangs. And when you shock these and dem demolish all of the housing projects, those gangs are forced to relocate mm -hmm. and all of the gangs that are affiliated with them have their power weakened. And so you see these sort of direct and indirect shocks um, happening around turf and also around recruitment. And I look at a variety of other shocks um, that have to do with um, recruitment shocks from deportation policies of the United States, um, migration shocks related to climate change, um, drug shocks that affect the resources of these groups. And so all of these different types of policies that I put under this big umbrella that are relatively exogenous shocks change the balance of power between these groups. And if you could just um, advance. Um, and what happens is that certain groups are shocked and other groups are not shocked. And where the groups are shocked, some of them, because of the nature of their relations with the um, civilian population, likely because of these types of civic associations that they may have, and they're able to have different relations with the population, um, and also because of the nature of the configuration and how factionalized they are, some of them are able to negotiate and bargain effectively to limit violence. They come up with accords and truces and informal arrangements that limit violence. And so in those cases, you don't have an escalation of violence where the groups are incapable of renegotiating the, their turf um, and their power. You see this ex, these turf wars with an escalation in violence. And what does this escalation in violence do? Let me go to the next slide. This increase in visible violence affects different parts of the population in different ways. And in work with Eduardo um, Moncada, we have been um, looking at how it affects different citizens' um, mm -hmm. demand for manadura and also their um, how actively they participate in politics um, and, in, and in civic engagement. Um, and in general, feeling unsafe, whether because of direct violence, direct victimization, or because of the media and fear mongering that happens in the media, Citizens tend to demand money. They, they um, research across the world has shown that feeling unsafe, you demand, you, you are willing to sacrifice your civil liberties and willing um, to forego them in, in order to have um, security. And if you go forward, um, what we um, show 
across the Latin American region is that pacing victimization, people sour on democracy, they support mm -hmm. monitor, they support strong arm governance. And this is both something that we see across the region and we also see it um, in Mexico looking at more local level violence um, that there is this relationship between exposure to violence and this um, demand for mano dura. Um, if you go forward, my um, book that came out with Princeton University Press um, in 2022 gives some insights into how parties then supply mano dura um, and under what conditions um, it's electorally expedient to run on um, an iron fist security policy. So finally, what does this mean? Um, this this demand and supply of monedora is essentially state criminal war. The state declares war against the criminal groups and in so doing shocks the balance of power between gangs. Of course, there are conditions under which they can universally, they can um, decapitate, um, can imprison, can whatever the strategy of um, uh, you know, in, and go into different raids or, or encroach on turf, they could do so in ways that don't shift the balance of power. That's not what tends to happen. They tend to dis differential, differentially weaken certain groups and relatively strengthen other groups, which goes and this sparks this whole process again. Um, and so this might seem tragic, but I'm working on <laughs> how to break these cycles of violence and the types of interventions that might be able to break what I think is a, a vicious um, play. Um, so uh, if you could go one slide forward. Um, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, before I open it up to questions from here in the audience and online, um, as I was thinking first, thank you to each, each one of each and every one of you for, for the thoughtful and important work that you're doing as well. Um, I had, um, Two questions that I just want to pose to my, my chair's role here at Edge of it, um, and, and, to, and to kind of put people in dialogue a little bit as well. Um, so, Sarah and Veronica, um, both of you highlighting your presentations, sort of the um, inadvertent negative effects of Manuela politics or state states taking on criminal actors, right? Um, and so, but you also highlight some informal, unorthodox ways that we can think about effective ways to reduce or constrain violence. Criminal pacts or truces in, in Sarah's work. Uh, Veronica, in your work, the sort of role of gender and the work that it does and that women can do in these types of contexts in the absence of a hard line by crackdown in the community, right? That, that allows that gossip to circulate and to be an effective tool against criminal actors and holding them back and restraining them from violence. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about those kind of unorthodox policy responses. Like, are these, have you thought about how these could be systematized or formalized, or should they remain in the informal domain? And if so, how do states and policymakers need to think about them uh, and think about these as avenues toward peace uh, and, and restraining types of violence in these contexts? And then I'll just pose the, the second question to put uh, um, Martina and, and Paul into, into conversation as well. Um, both because you're talking about Argentina, but also because you're talking about what seem to be related, but somewhat um, um, uh, not yet for me in my mind connected phenomena. So, so Paul, you're telling us, you're talking to us about a, a story of sort of executive power and the political interests uh, that motivate trying to control the police or allowing the police to sort of operate in free reign, right? Um, and what that does for the, the violence that the police engages in and including its involvement in drug markets. Uh, and then Martina, um, you know, the, the startling numbers you gave us and sort of the startling data you gave us about the way that the criminal justice system deals with different types of individuals from different social strata and different types of crime was really powerful. And, and one of the key things that I, that I took away from there was sort of the big role of interpersonal violence in the criminal justice system. And so I was trying to think through here, reflecting a little bit on kind of Javier Aguero's work, right? You're both sociologists. I'm not a sociologist, but I like sociology a lot. So I was thinking about Javier Aguero's work and this argument that um, if we're gonna think about violence, even in a place like Argentina, where you don't have the same dynamics of organized crime you have in Mexico or Colombia, that even in that context, you have to think of the sort of concatenation of violence, right? How violence at the interpersonal level, the riñas, are deeply connected to criminal markets and illicit drugs and organized crime in the form of gangs. 
And so I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit maybe to each other and to our audiences about sort of how you see those dynamics playing, if at all, in sort of the research that you've been doing. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, you guys, let you respond, and then we'll turn it over to our audience members for their questions as well. I don't know if Sarah and Veronica, maybe you wanna take it first, yeah? <laughs> Well, uh, yes, thank you for the for your question. Um, I will say that um, in the case of, of this community where there was a long tradition of civic organizations and thinking also in terms of public policies, um, these women were able to bargain and to negotiate because there was a long tradition of uh, organization and women were provided with opportunities to keep their children. So what, what you can see is that there is this possibility of um, collective efficacy to speak like as William Samson. Um, so, so they can bargain, but this collective efficacy, efficacy needs investment resources so the difference will be that um, states should invest in uh, strengthening um, communities' resources in that sense, providing opportunities for kids, for youth, instead of these mano dura policies that devastate communities, um, that, fa that, that um, turns the state in a main actor, actor of uh, massive human rights violations. That is what is happening in Venezuela. For instance, the International Criminal Court is today examining the government of Venezuela because of the massive human rights violations. So we know that uh, in the medium and long term, Mano Dura policies uh, increments violence and what they produced, for instance, uh, in Venezuela was a more sophisticated organization among the criminal groups. They got weapons from the police forces. So there is this complicity and communication that we can see in Ecuador, uh, for instance. So, so definitely um, these kind of policies that allows um, civic organizations and collective efficacy efficacity um, brings, uh, I will say, rights again into, into the discussion. Yes. Uh, so I've been thinking a lot about uh, this question and I don't think I yet have mm -hmm. a, a satisfactory answer, but how I've been thinking about it is that in my project um, and so many different shocks that oftentimes unintentionally or and are sort of exogenously shocking the balance of power between criminal groups. And some of this is from immigration policy, gun policy, um, uh, drug policy, um, uh, housing policy, et cetera. And so it's not oh, democ democratization as the great work of Sandra Ley and, um, and Guillermo Trejo has shown. Um, so unintentionally does so. But the question is, how could interventions seek to help the groups um, mediate and bargain effectively, even if maybe the shocks are sometimes inevitable because they're solving a different problem? Um, and in and there, I think that you see a success of a lot of types of actors um, that Veronica is talking about, where you have civil society um, or former gang members being able to be mediators and helping to transmit information. Um, and also because certain types of criminal groups seem better able to, to bargain after a shock, um, policies that undermine the tenure of these gangs, meaning they're uprooting them from their communities in ways that end up making it so that they don't have as good information and are less able to, to um, negotiate, or you break them down in terms of their you factionalize them and you fragment them in ways that they are less able to credibly commit and less able to negotiate effectively and then break down their command and control structure, all those types of policies end up backfiring in that you're making it harder for them to effectively bargain. Going to the, the 
horrific effects mm -hmm. of, of manadera in many places. I wonder if there might be, we do know that this demand for manadera comes when citizens feel un, um, insecure, but there is this sense that of course, it doesn't have to be so black and white. And so many policies that we debate are deemed you know, black and white. And of course, you do need a punitive side to any sort of criminal justice system. Um, but that needs to be complemented with many other. So I think potentially you can, there might be a way in which you could create support for something that is punitive, mm -hmm. but it is also has all of the you know, investigatory, judicial, um, mm -hmm. preventive side to it as well. I wonder if that might be, there might be some way, and also just bolstering um, the offer of the alternative to Manadora and seeing how that could become a, mm -hmm. um, electorally expedient when you have party turnover um, and prevention is never going to be with, you know, within party terms and et cetera, all the reasons that we know that the alternative is not as electorally um, Desirable for parties. Just to be a thought. Great. Um, maybe then Paul. Okay. Um, well, the first thing I would say um, is that in Buenos Aires, most uh, homicides are not linked to drug offenses. That's the first important thing. Um, in these cases, punishments, uh, I mean, in, in the cases of homicides linked to drug offenses, um, punishments are really harsh. I'm doing research on um, drug criminalization at the moment, and this is a hypothesis to, to work on, but I think that that harshness is especially related um, to the fact that they are uh, linked to drug offenses because there's a uh, strong criminalization of drug crimes at the moment. For instance, just to, uh, I, I didn't uh, spoke about this before, but uh, the, the average duration of punishments for minor drug offenses in Buenos Aires is around five and a half and six years of imprisonment, but minor drug crimes where there is no violence or anything related. So uh, there's a special harshness to, uh, towards this kind of, um, of offenses. And then the other important thing uh, I would like to mention has to do with uh, this kind of violence you mentioned. Uh, I'm of course, agree with that um, because what I, what I try to show, I don't know if I was very successful, but uh, it is that um, what is implicit or what underlies in this functioning of the criminal justice system is uh, well, how much um, is uh, which lives are worthier for the criminal justice system and which are not. So if these homicides are not very much important, well, this may be a kind of violence, the same thing as inequality or living under uh, a structural uh, situation of unemployment. This is also violent. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, I agree it's directly linked, but the way in which the criminal justice system punishes these homicides in relation to other offenses is also a way of uh, being violent with these people whose lives are not very much worthy uh, in comparison to stealing a car or selling two grams of marijuana. Uh, just one last thing, um, same information from data from the Buenos Aires Prosecution Office. I think that from the criminal proceedings initiated in 2022, like 80 something percent of the drug, which was um, like, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, like collected through criminal proceedings was marijuana. Hmm. So, Cis. Uh? Cis. well, see, yeah. Uh, so it's, uh, I think it has more to do with that than to that. So, great, great point. Paul? Well, I think it's a great question. And what, what is interesting about this, uh, about this, interprovincial comparison is then the chains, the links of the chains are very different, not only like they. Mm -hmm. And the link of uh, drug-related violence and homicide specifically is huge. It's very small, you were showing mm -hmm. like 11% related to drug crimes. And in, uh, in the capital of Santa Fe, which is the most violent one, it was like um, I don't remember incorrectly, it was something like 60% of crimes were related to drugs. Of all of us. 
but I, I, I have a really good year, but I really remember there was 35% of homicides were pre-planned killings with previous agreement of the killing. So that shows the centrality of the, of the, you know, the huge size of, we don't have comparative, and that's a big problem, we have comparative data on, on Cordoba, but there's also a correlation between uh, uh, but in Cordoba, uh, the, the the greatest association is with um, the, the lack of uh, with poverty and and crime markets, but but not to this. But we still don't have data. But comparing to Buenos Aires, uh, Santa Fe is clearly many more so many more related to drugs and many more related to specific groups which are existing and have the capacity to plan and direct uh, those killings. So that shows that the, it's an interesting uh, model that has to be filled up with more precise measurements of the structures of the, the chain. So, and that is directly related to institutional developments. I would add. Thank you. Well, why don't we open it up to questions? We've got, a, we've got an audience here as well. I'm sure we've got some, some questions for the, the panelists. We will go around. Please. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to address this question to uh, Dr. Sara and or uh, to the Veronica. Uh, let's start with, with Sara. Do you touch in, in your work uh, the interfere? I won't say internationalization, but rather integration along the lines of, and I'm being cynical, um, along the lines of you know, the fair and the impact. If you go back to 100 years before the fair um, Republic of Colombia, which comprised you know, three nations sharing the same flag, sharing the same everything. Uh, in your book, do you end up or if not, do you think it's uh, something worth studying? I mean, the uh, anecdotal, I mean, the, who would have, which uh, Chilean, uh, Chile used to be part of the area, uh, at the beginning, at the outset, would have uh, thought that Aragua was going to be part of the every day's uh, dictionary. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so help me out a little bit. What would be the, in what, yeah, yeah, what? No, it's, it's first, did you touch the, 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 this topic of the uh, somehow irrelevance of studying crime at, at the national levels? Yeah. Because the, 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 the international is what you exactly. count. Right. And uh, second, uh, what would be, if not, uh, you don't touch that in, in, in your book. Is, is that a line uh, that someone else has pursued uh, anywhere in the world? Not necessarily around the uh, around uh, Amsterdam and yeah. I think it's such a good question. Um, it's one of the reasons why you have so many of these exogenous shocks is partially because this is not and cannot draw borders around any of the any of these dynamics, and therefore all of these groups are constantly being affected. One, they are transnational. And two, they're constantly be effect, being affected by legislation across borders. Um, and that means that the populations that are oftentimes affected by the violence are disenfranchised with respect to voting on the legislation that can oftentimes affect them. And then at the same time, another sort of transnational part that I think about is the fact that the trans these transnational, the, the crime and the visible violence that uh, accompanies these turf wars often spreads across borders and can cause publics in other countries to demand manadora and parties to supply manadora, not only at a domestic level, but at an international level. Um, and I think that that is part of the explanation of the U.S.'s strategy policies vis-a-vis -vis Latin America would be somewhat of an analogous process, whereby violence in Latin America spreads to the U.S. and U.S. voters and U.S. parties are, are undergoing similar 
um, po uh, policy creation that then um, it's uh, their policy vis-a-vis -vis the region. And so I think that the thinking about it as you as you eloquently laid out is um, I think a great way forward. It's something that I am considering in the book. The book is definitely a work in progress, um, uh, but I think it's also something that other scholars should pursue. Question. Yeah, I wanted to ask um, Martina. I mean, I, I found the discrepancy that you found very interesting. I was curious. I know too little about like the descriptives of the Argentinian justice system, but I was curious what percentage of judges are female, and if you see this same discrepancy across male and female judges. How about the numerical models there? Yeah. Well, um, it it depends at the federal level. Well, but the federal level does not judge um, or investigates homicide. So <laughs> the province of Buenos Aires, um, I think they are like uh, eighteen percent. They are a minority in federal levels. They are even less. Um, I cannot tell you. Uh, I mean, I don't have numbers. It's very difficult to get access to uh, data on the judiciary in general and to make interviews as well. But um, I mean, I don't have numbers, but what I can tell you, because I interviewed also uh, female judges and female prosecutors, is that there's not a great variation in how they consider this. Uh, because another thing I didn't mention <laughs> that is also in, in, my, in my research is the importance that uh, property has for the criminal justice system. So I would say there's not a great difference, but I, I mean, I, I cannot give you numbers because I don't have them, mm -hmm. uh, but that's my my impression, that there's not a, a big difference. Uh, then, uh, one, sorry, one thing uh, that is a little bit different uh, in the case, of, in the case, sorry, of femicides and uh, when they have to uh, judge, for example, uh, mothers who kill their kids. In those mm -hmm. cases, that's a little bit different. Uh, what that is. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, my question is for Veronica. Uh, <clears throat> is it possible to make this type of civic organization in a larger scale than mm -hmm. the Manuda policies um, that Latin America cries for? Uh, an example is El Salvador in Chile, you know, everybody talks about it and everybody wants it. Mm -hmm. So, and also, how do we shift people's mentality of civic organization works and man of the policies don't work? <laughs> well, I think um, my research resonates with other research researchers, for instance, Anna Arjona. Uh, when she speaks about the fact that in those regions where there is a history of civic organization, the population has a wider bargaining capacity vis-a-vis uh, -vis rebels. Uh, but also here, William Samson's uh, research about collective efficacity. So these kind of researches, what demonstrates is that you have to invest in people, but these are middle and long-term solutions. Mm -hmm. And what is happening also is that we are trapped in, or politicians are trapped in electoral periods. That is why it's so popular and it's mm -hmm. so um, efficacy in terms of electoral votes. But other approaches such as, for instance, um, in Pernambuco, Brazil, or even Benjamin Lessing's proposal about conditional violence, what they demonstrate is that unconditional crackdowns originates more organization among criminals because criminals get prepared to respond. And that is what happened in Sao Paulo with the Maras before in Venezuela. So I will say that what we are seeing in El Salvador uh, we have to wait two or three years to see what is happening, how, I mean, when you see, when you, 
if you see images of the prisons right now, they are new prisons and Bukele is in the peak of, of his popularity, but this is going to routinize. And if you think the pace in which he's putting people into jails, you can understand that in one year or more, prisons are going to be, um, I mean, in a chaotic situation. So I guess it's a sort of predictable that you will have, again, this cycle of more organization and more sophistication of the criminal groups. Other approaches, for instance, uh, such as um, Akin Venmans, that is a Switzerland researcher, he speaks about pragmatic peace. And what, what he wants to mean is that um, one thing is when the state starts to do its work in terms of social rights in the communities. So it start, it's it's like carrot and sticks, right? It's like you the state starts to to have a presence in communities where it 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 had not a, a strong presence, and in that sense, it avoids new recruits. Because what is happening, for instance, in El Salvador or in our countries, what is happening with young men? What is happening in El Salvador where economic indicators are awful? I mean, what is he going to do? Is he, is he going to put uh, like the whole country in a jail with only Bukele and his friends out of it? I mean, at this pace, you can imagine that uh, a lot of persons are going to be into jail. So other approaches that... Um, Put the focus on, on, for instance, yes, in conditional crackdowns, you see that there is this sort of informal exchanges and paths that criminals know that they they can uh, bargain also with their violence. So, all the, but this means also that the state has to invest a lot in uh, police intelligence. And that is one of the, I mean, most difficult things in our countries. The state is not investing in, in police intelligence, but in these very spectacular crackdowns just to raise um, popularity. But well, the, the answers are not easy, but just we know that mano dura policies, we know from many countries that we will have the backlash in one or two years. I mean, I will I will tragically bet that we are going to see tragic uh, situations in, in El Salvador. For instance, in Venezuela, after the massive incarceration of young men in prisons, that gangs became more sophisticated, more organized criminal groups, more got more sophisticated web weapons, the state started in another phase of systematic killings. And that is why, again, the criminal court is in, investigating Venezuela because the police forces were responsible of 4,000 killings each year. This is more than in Brazil. Brazil has 200 million inhabitants. Venezuela has 29 million inhabitants police killings in Venezuela were higher than in Brazil. So I will say that the the, the future is, is so, I mean, it's predictably so, so tragic. And just to make a comparison of what you talked about, civic organization are from Guatemala, mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of indigenous groups yes. that have organized and you can see that communities are thriving and they have less uh, crime because they have had absent governments, so they have organized and, and the, the communities tried. So I guess that would be the answer to replicate this type of uh, uh, civic organization exactly. across the mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you. Are there other questions from the audience here? Yeah, please. Uh, I don't have a question anymore. I have this for Sarah's project. I work in Afia, I work in Salvador. It's an NGO. We basically collect and analyze data on international organized crime on a domestic and an international scale. So I think you can find like very useful tools and information there. And um, mm. in comparison to other data sets, that do basically a similar work to what we do. We are like researchers, human beings, <laughs> data every day. That's my work every day. I am focusing in Mexico now, but we cover all around the world. So it's very accurate data. 
and it can very very high make fighter and so actors locations and dynamics between actors state and non state so yeah just throwing out again can yeah. you repeat the, the name of it is a c l e d any other thoughts i think <laughs> Other questions? Uh, can we back there and then over here? Is that yes, we're um, I had a question that's less like maybe not able to be supported or maybe even more conceptual. You mentioned, Sarah, that Manuela policies are off the squad of the feeling of certain security. She was supposed to allow like, the demolition of the institution, basically, the sentence of like, off the layers. Um, and I was wondering if you saw any parallels between that and other like emotionally charged issues like xenophobia or racism, but things that basically provoke emotional response and then they lead to like citizens tolerating the liberal bits of the past. A really interesting question. Um the I mean there's the whole process I just had an article come out on immigration and xenophobia in the context of the Venezuelan uh, migratory um uh, hello to Colombia and why and under what conditions Colombians are xenophobic against their former brothers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and in that article, we find more support for, for sort of pocketbook um, uh, considerations and labor market competition um, that even can make it so that the co-ethnic bias goes away um, in a way that is, is slightly puzzling. But that all sorts of proximity, contact theory, um, so physical, so personal contact, familial proximity, that can sort of um, mitigate xenophobia. But I think it helps understand, even in the U.S., what you see among um, immigrant populations that can be xenophobic against new migratory flows. Um, that can have to do with labor market competition, but also with the fear of status reversal. Um, which sparks resentment and desires to sort of rectify the status, um, uh, the status hierarchy. And so I think you could see there, there's definitely a process. How that links to the conversation today um, is a bit of a, a, of a, a more of a leap, but that these are definitely all um, likely emotional processes. We're talking a lot here about fear. <laughs> Um, and the process that fear sparks with respect to desire for security, and it can make you flee, but in certain, but you also really want to figure out how to um, make yourself feel more secure. Um, and the need for security is such an inherent basic human need. Um, so I think we're talking a lot about fear. I think that you're raising a different set of emotions that often might have to do more with um, resentment, but also fear. I think that the fear extends to um, uh, fear of the other. Um, and so the contact that I just described can be a mitigating factor for that. So I work in the U.S. in child development and violence. And one of the things that I've seen in terms of like exposure to gangs and police, one of the things that I really not find is you know, resonating level transnational parties how um, the policing system has become very international in terms of training, finding, um, so I see the president of this in Central America. So I'm very curious in each of your works from the regions in terms of this transnational flex too, how do you see also these uh, systems that be very global? So U.S. is really military and police training also in Central America too. That's very curious in the region of Europe. You know, Paul has been working on something that starts to address this. Maybe yeah. you can take us on. Well, yeah, that's a very old, um, it's a very old process. You may be observing it now, but it's pretty old. It started really in the 60s, it's called the insurgency. But it, it, it wasn't only the only type of, of policing model that has mm -hmm. been exported after the transition to democracy also had community policing which is may, may be related to or also counterinsurgency especially in the US. <clears throat> so there's a variety of it depends on from where you are looking at 
uh, which type of policing uh, model or style. And even within the same police force, you may have the SWAT teams, which were spread around the, the region since the 80s, and <clears throat> also investigative police for community policing. So it's a definitely, yes, it's been a, it's a feature of Latin American policing forces that are highly influenced by American policing, but it's not only military policing, uh, it's, it's a whole variety. And what is going to come up, well, what is going to define each police force is going to be determined by well, mm -hmm. balance of power between police and executive and public demand, etc. In the cases, for example, of Argentina, in these cases, you have, a, of course, community policing in one province in all, but then they are more or less effective. And also you have the development of counter-narcotic policing, specialized forces for narcotic, or the proliferation of um, highly militarized approaches. And, and we are talking about a low crime equilibrium society. No? We're not talking about places where they have to invade some mm. and uh, control some through military means. We're talking about even cases in which there's low, 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 low violence. Um, you have this, uh, this presence of highly militarized styles and community-oriented intelligence level. So it's a yes, but it's it's a whole variety of them. Now we need to small. In our, in our in our last few minutes, I, know, I want to make sure that the people who've been posting questions on Zoom. As well, just get there as um, addressed too. So we have two questions. Uh, one for Martina. Um, do you believe that the masculinization of crime and uh, the naturalization of violence among yo younger, low-income men are these phenomena unique to Latin America? Um, good question. No, I don't. I mean, I, I don't think that because uh, if you look at like criminal rates in the U.S. and also in Europe men are also those who commit more crimes. In fact, female crime uh, started like being studied like in the 50s or 70s, maybe? well, maybe 50s. Uh, so it's something uh, new for uh, the scientific world uh, or the, the academic world as well. So no, it, it's not um, something special in Latin America, but uh, well, it's a very uh, kind of Characteristic trait in countries where we have very high violence rates. Uh, yeah, but it, I, I, I don't think it's, it's uh, something specific in in from Latin America. I don't know. It's, I don't know. Maybe you think something. <laughs> No, I mean, men are overrepresented in, in mm -hmm. violent crimes, so like, but worldly, so, so I guess it's not only Latin America. But what we haven't spoken a lot is that the um, persistent inequality in Latin America that is in the race, yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that helps, for instance, just to put again Venezuela as an example, it's interesting to see that uh, young women are more present in the educational system and young men are being more excluded. So young men are the ones that Same. are deserting the educational system. So it is there is something happening with uh, youth and masculinity in our countries that they are the ones that are integrating illicit economies. So inequality, is one um, important. very important part in the equation. What is happening with all these youth, uh, with all these young men in Latin America that are not being included in the formal economy? So it's very logical that they are going to migrate in those networks that can absorb them. So until we do not approach mm -hmm that uh, structural characteristic of our countries, we will have this persistent reproduction of crimes and young men. In, in, and, and, and I will add, there, there's also the feminization of the, of the labor market. Mm -hmm, exactly. So have, yeah, the, the, the but education it's, yeah. it's also true that, uh, at least in Argentina, well, in Latin America in general, um, over the last years, this inequality is also impacting female population. Mm -hmm. And you see that, uh, 
uh, I'm with this project at the moment that um, the the female population in, in in Argentina is mostly there for drug crimes. So they are starting to get involved in this informal illicit economies and uh, due to drug policies also in the criminal um, like in the criminal system, yeah, like in penal circuits. Mm -hmm. So it starts by men, but it's true that inequality is an important variable and it impacts also women. Thank you. And then um, to close us off here, there's one last question and it's a directed to Paul. Um, and there was a question in the chat about you know, the relationship between the police and the judiciary system in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And so sort of what do you see as uh, the potential for collaboration, more collaboration between police and judicial systems to address violence in the region? <laughs> in a minute. In a minute. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a huge question. But, but the thing, but as a general take, is there has been an increase in my day, especially like in Colombia. In Chile has a long, had a weak judiciary, has a, a big one. In Argentina, in most of the region, the judiciary has increased its power, its power within the state. And that produces a, a greater presence mm -hmm. and also a greater capacity of controlling and collaborating with the police. So that would be my, my general take. And yes, of course, now the collaboration is, is again, just like yeah. the, 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 very, the state is very diverse, the judiciary is very diverse, and the police is also very diverse. So there is a specific other varieties um, uh, on the ways in which sectors of the police relate to the judiciary. I think it's really important to work more on that. That's actually my presentation was much more about that, about how the increase in the criminal procedure reform, which means more powerful prosecutors, means different uh, levels of control of the police, but different and capacities to, to produce uh, legally relevant uh, prosecution and crime control. Um, what I see is an increase in the, in the power of prosecutors and therefore the greater connections with the specific sectors of the police. Um, also, I see like a huge expansion of highly militarized sectors, which are less like, uh, involved in collaborating with the police and that produce and protect all of this criminality. Uh, so it's, it's a very complex question, but in general, you would say an increase the presence of the judiciary of prosecuting and collaborating with sectors of the police. Well, I want to thank our four panelists for really provocative presentations, our audience members, really wonderful questions and dialogue. Uh, obviously, this is not the last time we can talk about these issues. There's a lot <laughs> left to research and lots left to discuss. But for now, thank you and thank you to the Institute of Latin American Studies for hosting this event as well. Yeah.